Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Hallelujah. We're good? We're good, we're good, we're good. Okay, we still don't know what that noise is, but that might just be us. All right. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, we'll hope that that little thing goes out. Um, okay, let's pray together. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God, today we praise you and we praise the work of Jesus Christ. On this Palm Sunday, we celebrate the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The one whom you sent God for all nations and all people. The one whose throne is eternal in the heavens and whose kingdom is without end. We humbly acknowledge that even as this holy week begins with the parade into Jerusalem, it ends with the funeral march to Calvary. Oh God, forgive us for wanting to glide easily from Palm Sunday to Easter. Forgive us for not wanting to follow your son through the stages of humiliation, brutality, suffering, and death that lie between here and there. God, today we pray that you would prepare us, O oh Lord, for the days and the events which are ahead. Keep us ever mindful of the undying love you have for all of humanity and for the future filled with hope that you have for each of us. Today, O oh Lord, turn our eyes upon Jesus who indeed is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and set our hearts on him as he does for us what we could not do for ourselves. Offer you a living sacrifice that is truly holy and acceptable in your sight. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome. To worship. My name is Danielle Bridgeforth, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve as a senior pastor of our church here in Arlington, Virginia, and we do welcome you to the church at Clarendon on this glorious Palm Sunday. We're so grateful for your gathering, both in the sanctuary as well as virtually. Thank you for being patient on both ends as we work through our sound difficulties, and thank you for your prayers. And we are excited about what God is doing in our midst. Um, the, our mission at the church at Clarendon is that we invite you to discover Christ and to live a life of purpose and passion. We want you to know God, and we want you to live purposely and passionately in relationship with God and with one another each day. And we believe that our community is helping us all to do that. And so as we have mentioned, it is Palm Sunday. We have our palms here, which we're going to bless and be able to give out at the end of service. And so I hope that we are okay with the contrast of emotions that come with today. Well, we certainly want to give you an opportunity to greet one another. And so if you'll take a moment to just turn around beside you, around you, and say good morning, hello to someone in the midst, that would be good for us to do today. Amen. <clears throat> Amen, amen, amen. 
Well, we certainly want to say happy birthday and happy anniversary to all of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Uh, we thank God for your life and for your marriage, for your ministry. We're praying that this is your very, very best year yet. Um, there are quite a few things going on this week that we want to make sure that we get to you by way of um, by way of announcements. Um, so first, understand and recognize that this is Holy Week, and so we want you to see our Holy Week um, activities and our services. Of course, today is Palm Sunday, and then we will be back here together on Thursday, this Thursday, Maundy Thursday. We'll be serving communion outside our front steps um, down at the corner right there um, at between 5 and 7. A weather permitting, if it's inclement weather, if it's a little too cold, we'll serve you right here in our welcome hall. So please come. Of course, Maundy Thursday is when Jesus instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, and so we want to honor that. Um, and then on Good Friday, we will also be here in our sanctuary, in our entire sanctuary. We will be um, representing and walking through the steps of Jesus um, on Good Friday with the stations of the cross. And so we will have a total of 12 different stations set up um, from our welcome hall, the sanctuary even out in the vestibule, um, that will represent a different step that Jesus took in terms of going towards the cross. Um, and so to be an interactive um, and very engaging way for us to experience Good Friday. Um, this is a tradition that often is seen in the Episcopal tradition, um, but we're okay, we're Baptists, we do whatever works for us, right? Um, and so it's going to be a good way for us to interact and to remember and be able to contemplate with prayer, with readings, with silence, but also in community as we go through. And so because we don't want it to get too crowded, uh, we'll do this at 5.30, at 6.30, and then at 7.30, um, because we'll be walking through each of the individual stations. Um, and so try to come on the hour so that we can do it as a group, and then the next one will start. It'll take us about 30, 35 minutes to get through um, each of the each, each time, um, but we want to make it um, make it so that we all can, can participate in that. And then, of course, on next Sunday. It is Resurrection Sunday, and so we will have our crosses here, and they will be able for you to flower. We'll have flowers beginning at 6.30 a.m. We will have a sunrise worship service only in person. That service will not be streamed. The 7 a.m. service will only be in person, um, and that will be a short service that we will just honor God, and then we'll go into a fellowship breakfast. We hope you'll come and join us for breakfast, and then, of course, we'll have our regular service, which will be hybrid at 11 a.m., and you'll be able to, to follow follow the crosses and we'll be here together. So please make plans to join us, please. Um, there's another service going on on Good Friday um, with the Arlington Coalition of Black Clergy, of which I serve as the vice president. And so we will be over at um, Mount Olive Baptist Church on Friday at 12 noon for a service. And so if you're able to come to that, if that's, that's a more traditional service. And so if you want to hear preaching and singing that usually happens on Good Friday, come over to Mount Olive, which is right here in Arlington and participate in that service with us. Um, and also want to let you know about something else going on. And please um, put this on your calendars and RSVP on Saturday, April 13th. Um, we will be hosting, along with Arlington County, something that they call the First 15. It's an emergency preparedness training course. And what happens in this time is that they give us different trainings and understanding about what would happen if there was an emergency, if there was an active shooter, if there was an issue in our congregation or in your midst, and what we needed to do between the time that law enforcement and the first responders got there so that we would know how to tie a tourniquet, we would know how to move somebody if necessary, and just be able to respond. This is the kind of thing that we wish we didn't have to go through, but it's good to be prepared. I've taken a similar type of training when I was preparing to be a community chaplain in Fairfax County. It's very good, it's very solid, and it helps you to feel empowered. And you'll also get an emergency kit that you'll be able to take home. And so will you join us, please? Um, all you have to do is email us to church info, let us know you're coming. But that's gonna be Saturday, April 13th, from 12 noon to 2 15. Um, it's open to anybody in our midst, anybody, not just our church. And so please think about coming, being here so we can get that training. And then once you get the training, you'll be able to help others in your neighborhood. Amen. And so we hope that you'll be here on April 13th with us. All right. 
can't remember what's next. I'm waiting on y'all to tell me. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes, the multimedia ministry needs you. If you are good at troubleshooting and praying and being patient, <laughs> then you too should be a member of our multimedia ministry. Uh, we have opportunities to serve, and I know I did get an email from someone this week about helping, and I'll get back with you. But if you're interested in helping with the slides, interacting with our community, working with our online community, working with the sound, we're training up people now to be able to fit in and to fill in and to work alongside that ministry. So please let us know. Um, you can email me or you can email us at churchinfo at 1BC. All right. And there will be no Bible study this Wednesday because I want to free you up to come to our Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday worship services, okay? So we won't be here on Wednesday for Bible study, but I'm giving you that time so that you can come on Thursday and on Friday and be with us then. So I'm such a good, loving, encouraging pastor, right? All right. So please know, no Wednesday night Bible study, but come and be with us this week. But we will be in prayer tomorrow afternoon at 12 noon, and then also on our prayer conference call line at 7 a.m. on Wednesday morning. And I think that's everything. God bless you, and thank you. We're now moving to our time of giving. Uh, for those of you who are in the sanctuary, you will find envelopes um, located on the sides of the boxes to my left and right, and baskets on top of the white, fold, white speakers. You can deposit your offering there anytime you feel comfortable. You can also go to our website or our app. You can text to give, and many people mail their gift in here to the sanctuary, to our church office. We're thankful for all the ways that you give, and we want you to know that we appreciate you. I also do want to let you know that we are still receiving um, our sharing Thanksgiving offering. Um, this past week, as I noted in the newsletter yesterday, um, we blessed at least 156 people. 44 different gift cards went out to different people in our community for groceries. Um, and so that cost, of, amen, amen. And so we are thankful to be able to do that. And we are still receiving, um, receiving donations to be able to offset the cost of purchasing those things. They've already been purchased. They've already been mailed out. We're not waiting on the money. Money. We're just asking you if you still want to give, you can give back to that to recoup that. So we'll be ready for Thanksgiving when we do it again. And if you go online, you'll see a holiday gift cards um, option to give online. And you can give directly to that. And that is how you know the money will go there. Let's pray together. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. We're so grateful, God, for the gift and the gifts that you give unto us. And now, God, we give hilariously. We give cheerfully. We give obediently back to you and to this local branch of Zion, just a small portion of how you've blessed us. So, God, thank you for the gifts, and thank you most of all for the givers. Thank you, Lord God, for what you will do with these funds. Will you multiply them, and will you take them farther than we could ever go so that others might know that Jesus loves them and that Jesus saves to the utmost. God, continue to bless us and make us a blessing, we pray, because of our generosity and our obedience to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for your giving.
Jesus. One more time. His name is Jesus. Jesus. We lift you up. We lift you up. Amen, amen. We certainly do lift up Jesus. The highest praise we can give to God is our obedience, amen, and our living a life that's yielded to God. And so we do that with our entire beings. We're now moving to our time of prayer, and so I invite you to please fill out a prayer request card if you um, have a specific prayer request, a prayer need, or a praise report that you would like to leave with us. Um, you can do that. You'll find those on the white speakers and on the sides of the boxes I mentioned to you earlier, and we will be praying together tomorrow at 12 noon, and then on Wednesday morning, we'll be on our prayer conference call line, and we hope that you'll be praying with us. Um, we're going into our final week um, of our Lenten devotional, our final week of our Lenten devotional. This final week is uh, the themed in victory in Jesus. And so as we go through Holy Week, we hope that you will continue to read through our devotional. And if you haven't plugged in yet, go ahead and plug in. You can find it on our website, and you can read along with us each day. Of course, there are many things for which and about which we are praying locally, nationally, as well as internationally. And so we are remembering those who are grieving, remembering those who are journeying through recoveries from different surgeries and sicknesses. Um, it's good to uh, see some back in our congregation who haven't been here with us for a while. We've been praying for you, and we're grateful for your journey and for your recuperation. Um, certainly uh, praying about uh, the situation that happened in Russia and that attack at the concert this earlier this week, and the many things going on nationally and internationally, uh, the many countries and communities for which we're praying. Um, I've been concerned about this weather, um, just the turn in the weather, and um, certainly we know that impacts a lot of people, and so let's be mindful of those um, who, who might not have coverage and covering and home and shelter and be praying and making sure that we can plug into those different means. Um, and certainly we're praying for you and for all that you might be going through and for our church. Uh, we do celebrate even and that um, for those of you who haven't been here, you might not have known, but for those who've been coming in person, uh, we had lost our monitor in the back probably about three months ago, maybe. Um, and so we now have our monitor in the back. And uh, nobody's more grateful than me and everybody on the stage because we were the ones who were trying to read it. And it's far away. It's really far away. And so when Steve and I were at BJ's trying to buy it this week, I was trying to be, you know, economical. And I'm trying to be a good steward over the monies that we have. And so I was saying, well, maybe we just can get a 55 inch um, because the one we had up there was 62. And, and I was like, we could save like 150 bucks. And his Steve was like, well, what's the purpose of it? To make you be able to see better? I think you need to get a bigger one. I was like, but then when I came in today, I was like, thank God, because I can't imagine if we would have had a smaller one than that. So anyway, I'm glad that uh, reasonable minds prevailed and we got the bigger monitor so that the pastor can see. Uh, but we thank God uh, for the ways that our community is able to do those things and take care of, of our bills and take care of ministry. And it is because of the generosity and the love of our community. And we're grateful. And so now I will pause and let you lift your quiet prayer request to the Lord, and Deacon Chris is going to lead us in prayer today. Let us bow for prayer. Father, Palm Sunday is a reminder that the King of Kings died for our sins. Jesus did not look like the Messiah your people hoped for. He came riding in on a donkey and spoke of peace. He didn't come to conquer the government as the military warrior. He continued on to accomplish your will in peace, not in panic. He came to bring us his peace. Father, how quickly we forget the peace we possess in Christ. Even on the hardest day, remember us and surround us with your peace. Remind us minute by minute as we navigate difficult days and trying times. We can walk through trouble, trial, and pain because of our Savior sustains us. He has already walked the most difficult path and died to defeat death we deserve. All of the pain we experience on this earth is temporary. 
for those who embrace him as Savior will be eternal with him in heaven. In the same sacrificial way, let us be willing to take up the cross daily and lay down our lives for the people you have placed in them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So surely we will be all right because we'll journey on with you. We give you all honor, all glory, and all praise. God, in these moments of preaching and teaching, let the words of my mouth and the collective meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. 
God, we thank you for these palms that are here today on our altar, recognizing, God, that they are just normal and natural means, but will you give them spiritual significance in our life, even as we pick them up and leave service today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Will you praise God with me for our praise and worship ministry and the wonderful way that they have guided us into the presence of God today. We're grateful for our multimedia ministry as well as for our welcome and hospitality team and our deacons and all the ways that everybody leads us and encourages us and sets the stage for us to be in ministry together. Amen and amen. Well, I realize we lost some time while we were waiting to get the sound done. I can't rush through a speed talk my sermon, but I'll be mindful of that. Um, today we are finding ourselves in John chapter 10. John chapter 10, which might be a familiar passage to us. Um, it's not the traditional Palm Sunday verses, but nevertheless, the Lord has a word for us today. John chapter 10, I'll begin reading at verse 11 from the New Revised Standard Version, and I will take our reading down to verse 18. John 10 and 11 simply is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my own and my own know me. And just as the father knows me and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. You may take your seats, and for the moments that are ours to share today, I want to speak with you from the topic, the theme, the subject, the heart of commitment, trust. The heart of Commitment, trust, amen. We have been journeying through this season, uh, this month, looking at the importance of commitment. We've been looking at how critical it is that you and I maintain our commitment through every situation and circumstance in life. And so what I've been trying to share with us over the last several weeks is simply this, that our commitment or our faithfulness to God can be the greatest determinant of our success in life. That, that very often the question that we have to ask ourselves, the question that might be asked of us or we might ask of others is simply this, will we finish our journey of faith or will we stop short? Are we going to stick with God, or are we going to let go of God when things get hard, when stuff gets difficult, when the path starts to go in a way that we didn't anticipate, when the answers to our prayer don't come the way we wanted, uh, when the doors don't open in the time and the way that we thought that they would or should, are we going to remain faithful to the God who has loved us and who secured our salvation? This is the essence of life. And it's not always easy uh, because we don't know what life holds. We don't know what life holds for us, for our families, for our communities, and for our world. But we do know that when we trust in the Lord, 
we will have the salvation and the help that we need. And so over the last several weeks, I talked about some of the things that would test us. And I talked about the fact that in life, in our journey through life, our call of faith, our journey of faith might find us being tested by certain circumstances. Circumstances that we might feel are outlandish. Circumstances where we are outsiders, where we're the only one who sees it from our perspective. We might be the only one walking by faith. We might be the only one trusting in the Lord and saying, well, let's pray about it. And even circumstances where we're outmatched. But we know, I don't have enough strength, I don't have enough education, I don't have enough power or knowledge to get this thing right, and so I need God. I need God. But when we, when we fall into those types of circumstances, what we have to remember is that God will meet us at those times when things are outlandish and it doesn't make sense. It just it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't calculate. God, you said this, and I did this, and we went here. How am I being faced with this circumstance? I always ran and, and ate my vegetables and pushed away from my sweets. How can I have this diagnosis? What's, what's going on in life? Well, what we have to remember is that when these circumstances come to our life, this is not a reason to give up. It's an opportunity for us to know I've got to dig in that I've got to work a little bit harder. It's not the time to let go. It's the time to hold on for dear life. And, and so when we stay committed and we can stay committed through those types of circumstances, I said, this is just a review. If you missed these sermons, you can go back to our website or to our YouTube or Facebook page. And today there are sermon notes available in the app to guide you and go with you on this sermon. But if we, we can stay committed if we remember a few things. We looked at Esther, right? And he said, Esther was able to, to show up in her hard time because she remembered her identity. That, 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 that we can, re like Esther, we can remember who we are, and that will help us to persevere and to stay faithful. That, that when we pay attention to who's in our proximity, who's around us, what has God given us, what has God put into my hand, that maybe I'm outmatched, but if I, if I link up with somebody who's near me, I won't be outmatched. And so I can come together, and ultimately, we have to take advantage of op opportunities. And so I talked about how sometimes we're standing in front of an open door, that the pathway is there, and we just have to have the faith, the courage, the wisdom, the strength, the stick to to keep on going and not quit simply because the path might not look like we expect it. Because sometimes we get to a place where we can't really turn back. All we can do is just go back, go forward, because going back would be difficult. It's not to say you couldn't go back, but going back would be so arduous that it would almost be not worth it. I, I remember several years ago, I was in New York at a camp with my young people. With, I was youth pastor then, and we were at this place, and we were going through this high ropes course. Anybody ever done high ropes courses? And I had made my way through all of the different apparatuses that you go through to the very last one, which was a 50 or 60 foot free fall. And essentially, we were harnessed up as we were the whole time, and all you had to do was get to the ledge, step off the ledge, and go. And even though I knew I was harnessed up because I had been going through all the other apparatuses, when I got to that one, man, let me tell you, I was scared. And it didn't help that I had seen all of these 14, 15, and 16-year-olders that I was supposed to be the guide and the leader and the teacher to. They had just done it without even thinking about it. They were like, woo. And I got there, and I was like, what? And I had to make a decision. Am I going to try to go back the other way, through all the other ways that I, or am I just going to trust and jump and let this thing catch me? Well, I had some encouragement, because they were saying, come on, Miss Danielle, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. We did it. We got you. We know it's scary, but it's going to be okay. And I, I took the leap. I jumped off, and I did it, and it felt great. I don't want to do it again, but I did it. <laughs> but, but, but that's how it is sometimes with our faith, that we've come so far, 
And you could turn around, you could stop, but that would be the undoing of you and all your work. It would impact others who are looking at you, who are expecting you to go, who are trusting you to be able to have the faith to follow through on what you said at the beginning. We have to just make sure we take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us and not give up. Well, I want to tell you, I came by today on this Palm Sunday to let you know that if there's anybody who knows what I'm talking about, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is the perfect example of one who stayed committed through every season, every circumstance, every challenge and setback of his life. Oh, Jesus knew who he had picked. He knew that those same brothers that had walked with him would deny him. He understood that his own family, his own siblings wouldn't believe in him. He knew that the very town that he had come from was a town that no one expected anything good to resonate from. But Jesus didn't let any of the circumstances in his pedigree and in his, his life, the betrayals, the abandonment, the problems of his journey, keep him from securing our salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. That, that Jesus didn't turn back around when things got hard. And because Jesus didn't do it, you and I now have the strength we need to keep going. And Holy Week was the start of Jesus' greatest test in life. This, this week where we, we remind ourselves about the passion of Christ, how he persevered through the, 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 the contrast of emotions him having all power, but yet just releasing his power and letting himself become into the hands of man. That, that he could have come down from the cross, but he decided to stay there for you and I. And, and Jesus endured, Jesus overcame to secure our salvation for one reason, I believe, and that is because he decided to trust God. And so that's why today I'm letting you and I know that the heart of commitment, the heart of everything I've been talking about really is this, will I trust in the Lord? This is what we have to ask ourselves each and every day. Do I trust me or do I trust God more? Because you should trust yourself. I'm not saying don't trust yourself. I'm not saying check your wisdom at the door. I'm not saying do things that are, don't, are silly and, and don't have any sense of wisdom to them. I'm not telling you to act like you're stupid when God has made you smart. Because God has given us all of our senses and all of our emotions and all of our experiences, they mean something. But the fact of the matter is, we can't put more stock in our perspective than we can the truth and the Word of God. That I can trust myself and I should, but I need to trust Jesus more than I trust me. Because if it's up to me, man, I'm telling you, some things ain't never going to get done. Some places I'm never going to go if it's just going to be based on me and whether I want to go or whether it looks like it'd be fun. Some places you're like, yeah, I want to go there. Other places you're like, nope, I don't want to go. Mm -mm, I don't have no desire to go there. And, and so we got to do what Jesus did, and, and that is we have to trust in the Lord. And we have to keep on trusting even when things get difficult. And, and so here's what I see that Jesus did. Jesus trusted God for, his pur for the purpose for his life. That's how he was able to keep going towards his destiny and secure our salvation. Jesus trusted God's purpose for his life, but also Jesus trusted God's plan for salvation. And thirdly, Jesus trusted God's power to do it. That, that when Jesus was weak in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't let his weakness trump God's strength that was available to him. And you and I have to do the same thing. The, the first thing I said is that Jesus trusted God's purpose for his life. When you get to John 10 and where I picked up the text, this is one of Jesus' great I am statements here in John 10 and 11. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he goes through all of the things that he is to be and what describes the good shepherd. And he makes this contrast between the shepherd and the one that's hired. 
And he talks about the fact that he cares. He talks about the fact that he knows his sheep, that his sheep know him, and he understands that even though the one who's hired would leave and run away when they see danger coming, he says, I'm the good shepherd. I stay right there. Jesus articulates his understanding of his purpose. When Jesus was in the garden, when Jesus was being betrayed, when Jesus was on the cross, he was remembering the purpose that he had for coming in the first place. Jesus at one point said, you know, how can I, isn't this the reason that I came? I want this moment to pass. In the moment, it feels like it would be better to let go. But actually, when I think about it, this is the very reason why I'm here. This is my purpose. And Jesus' trust in God's purpose for his life is what made the difference between him letting go and hanging on. But it wasn't just that he knew his purpose. Don't miss this. He articulated his purpose. He was able to say, I am the good shepherd. Because Jesus knew that being was better and more important and larger than doing. And let me help someone here. You're looking at your purpose. You're trying to figure it out. You're saying, I don't know what God has purposed for me to do. And you might have to change your reflection and change your perspective because it's not so much about what God wants you to do. It's who God has called you to be. God wants you to be faithful. God wants you to be a provider. God wants you to be a preacher. God wants you to be an entrepreneur. God wants you to be and walk in your destiny. And it's not just about the things that you do, but who you are. And the reason that I know this is so is that even if you don't have the position, you still think like that. Like there are times in my life that I'm not, I haven't practiced law for over 10, 12, 15 years almost, but there are times when I still think like a lawyer. That as soon as I see a problem, I start, my brain starts working just like lawyers work. Because I was a lawyer for a long time, and I'm never going to not be it, even though I might not be practicing. And so our purpose is about being, and Jesus knew who he was, and he trusted that if God called me to be, I'm going to be okay. His identity was secure. And for some of us, this is our issue, is that we don't trust what God's purpose is for our life. We trust our own. We don't want to go outside of our comfort zone because it's nice and cushiony and and comfortable there. But at some point in time, the baby outgrows the crib. Listen, and the thing that used to keep us comfortably will become actually uncomfortable, and that's how we know that we have to move. Now, it would be crazy for some of these new moms and dads that we have to have their baby, their child at eight or nine years old, still trying to climb up into a crib. We would say, that's not, that, that doesn't make any sense. Why you, why you got that girl in a crib? She's 10 years old. But, but, but that's sometimes the way we interact with God. Because God is trying to move us on in our purpose and get us to step out and step into the things that God has prepared for us, the good works, as Ephesians says. And we say, no, I want to I cram myself into this crib where it used to be comfortable. No, when we trust God's purpose for our life, we'll be able to stay committed. That's the heart of commitment is to trust. And so we've got to be like Jesus. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd that I know who I am, I know what I've been called to do, I know where I'm supposed to be, and because of that, I'm going to keep on going. But, but not only did Jesus trust God's purpose for his life, but secondly, Jesus trusted God's plan for salvation. And this is the other thing, and I'm going to say, y'all, this gets me sometimes, that, that sometimes I'm looking at what God is doing, and I'm saying, God, I don't even understand what your plan is right now. How are you going to work this out? How are you going to bring this together for my good? What are you going to make of this? Sometimes it's my mistakes. Sometimes it's the things that I have done wrong, and I'm saying, God, I know you can't fix this. It's been too long. I, I messed up too royally. 
I, I said no too much or I've fallen too many times. And God is just saying, give your life, give your heart, give your faith, give your trust to me. Give me the pieces, even that you have broken, and I will make it make sense. Because I have a plan. Jesus understood his assignment, and he knew God's ultimate plan to save humanity through his sacrifice. So, so when Jesus got into the garden, when Jesus got around these people who were treating him improperly, when they started challenging his identity, he didn't just say to them, man, look, forget this, I'm going back home. I got, a, I got a place beside Yahweh in heaven. I got a throne waiting on me. I don't have to sit here and deal with, oh, excuse me, Jesus Jesus probably wouldn't have had the attitude like that. that was, that's what I was, I, don't, I ain't got to stay in here and take this from y'all, okay? <laughs> but, but Jesus is like, look, I know the plan that God has. Jesus is not like us, thank God. We got to be like Jesus. That, 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 that Jesus understood that the plan, it's right here in the word in John 10, Jesus, after he understands and articulates his purpose, he, he talks about the fact, I'm a good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just like the father knows me and I know my father. And he says it here, I lay down my life for the sheep. In John 10 and 16, he says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Jesus is talking about the fact that, that God had a plan to bring and to reconcile Jews and Gentiles, we're the Gentiles, into one new humanity. That, that Jesus' death wasn't for nothing. Jesus' death was to bring about a new humanity and a new way of living and being. That, that Jesus rode in on a donkey showing his gentleness and his humility when most kings came in on horses. Most kings came in with a whole bunch of people all around them clearing the way. Jesus was in the center of the crowd riding on a lowly donkey because he was still fulfilling all of the steps of the plan that Jesus had for him, that God had for him. The, the reason that, that Jesus could hold on to the plan even when things got shaky is because he knew his father. And I don't want you to miss this. When the things and the circumstances and the situations that you're going through don't line up for you, take your eyes off of the what and put your eyes on the who. Even when the what and the how is confusing and unclear, the who will remain clear and steady and in force. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God does not change. In God, there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. There's no way you can look at God and not see goodness and grace and mercy and love and peace. So when your circumstances don't line up the way you want them to, look at God. Jesus knew his Father, and that's why he could trust the plan. Because he said, well, if God has it for me, then I know if God has said it, I'm going to do it. So he knew his father, and he also knew that he was loved. He says it right there, that the father loves me for this reason, John 10, 17, the father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. When you get unsure about what God is doing, you can go back and strengthen your commitment by remembering who called you and the one who loves you perfectly. You are completely loved. And the thing that makes this thing so crazy, Elder Colin, is that God's love for us is not determined by if we do the thing anyway. That, 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 that God isn't sitting there saying, I'm going to give you some more love when you act right. Anybody? 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 Just look straight. If it's you, don't, don't worry. Don't, don't respond. People won't know it's you. Because you said that to someone last week. Nah, I can't. Uh-uh. You ain't been acting right. I can't love you that way. You ain't been doing what I want you to do, so no, I'm not going to give you that love. I'm so glad God isn't like us. 
So when I know I'm loved, that helps me to maintain my commitment because my love and the love I receive is not based upon my commitment. It's simply my response to knowing that I'm loved. I'm not loved. I'm not doing it so I can get love. I'm doing it. I'm being obedient. I'm following through. I'm pushing into the part, the hard part. I'm walking in my destiny because I know I'm loved, because I know God has called me, because I know God wants to use my life, and I want to participate in what God has for me. Jesus wasn't unclear about the fact that he was called and he was loved. He knew his father had a plan and a purpose, and he knew that that plan and purpose included him laying down his life. But not only did, did Jesus maintain his commitment because he shows us the heart of commitment is trust by trusting God's purpose for his life and by trusting God's plan for salvation. But lastly, Jesus trusted God's power to do it. That, that when you get to the end here of the verses that I read today in, in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says, no one takes it from me, his life but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command or this authority from my Father. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, friends, uh, because you can articulate your purpose. Um, you can know that God has called you, um, and you can trust the plan, and you can know that God has something good for you to do. But ultimately, you have to trust that all the power and authority that you will need to walk out your purpose and fulfill your destiny will be given to you when you need it at the right moment and in the right way. Jesus said, look, I have, I'm laying my life down because I already believe I have the power to pick my life up again. He had said this in John 10. This was weeks before he went into Jerusalem. This was a long time when he was setting up the stage for who he was and what he'd come to do. Jesus was already convinced that whatever power I need, whatever circumstance I need, whatever situation I need to be changed, uh, whatever experience I need, I, God will give it to me in the moment that I need it because God will, will take care of and make sure that I have the power to walk this thing out. Some of us are sitting there saying, God, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I'm called. God, I can't go in this way. God, I can't follow through. God, this is too much for me. And you're right. It might be too much for you, but it's not too much for you when you have been infused with God's power. And so you've got to believe that all the power, all the authority that you need, God is going to give it to you. Jesus was secure in God's command and so he acted on God's word. He said, I've already been given the command to pick my life up again, so I'm going to go ahead and lay it down freely. I'm going to live my life and die this commitment journey because I know that when I get through Friday, Sunday's coming. And as we go into this Passion Week, we, we need to be with Christ in his pain be with Christ in his torment. Walk with Christ through the roads of Gal all the way up to Golgotha's Hill. We're going to feel the nails on Friday in our Good Friday time. We're going to see the cross. We're going to feel the, the, the thorns. But, but ultimately, we do all of that so that we can remember and celebrate the victory that's coming. Jesus was secure. And because he was secure in God's plan, he went ahead and did and fulfilled his purpose because he knew it wasn't going to be by his power, but by God's power at work in him. And that's the reason why we can say hallelujah. That's the reason why we can say salvation and glory, honor and power belong to you, O oh God. Why? Because even when I'm at my weakest, you have the power I need to be strong again. That even when I don't know, you still have a plan for my life. That even when I'm out of order and not in position, your purpose is still calling me and drawing me and beckoning me forward. Friends, we don't know what life will hold for us. But I hope you see in Jesus that the heart of commitment is that you will trust in the Lord no matter what comes no matter what goes 
the Hebrew boys, when they were in the fiery furnace, before they went in, they said, our God can do it. He can keep us from having to go through this thing that you're saying you're going to do to us, King. But even if he doesn't, I've already decided I'm going to trust in the Lord. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you need to say, even if God doesn't bring this thing around the way I want it brought around, Nevertheless, I'm going to trust because God has power, God has a plan, and God created me on purpose and with purpose. And for that reason, I will praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory. to do is trust God with our life. And so today we offer Christ to you through this prayer of salvation. Because friends, it's not always going to make sense to our mind's eye. It's not going to feel good to our body and to our emotions. But God's plan and purpose and power are sure. We can bank on them. But it all starts with relationship. And it all starts with our trust. And, and so we invite you to pray this prayer of salvation. Our deacons are standing here. The altar is open if you want to come to the altar for prayer. If you want to join our church and be baptized, let us know that. If you need prayer virtually or here in person, come up and let us know. But we pray this prayer of salvation as an affirmation of our faith. And perhaps someone is praying it for the very first time today because you've got to be in relationship to carry out purpose and plan and power. Let's pray together. Dear God, I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross for me and rose from the dead. Help me with any part of me that does not believe. I confess that I have made mistakes and I ask for your forgiveness. I invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, won't you let us know if you're worshiping with us virtually, if you're here in the sanctuary, if you want to know the next steps to, to join our church, the next steps to get baptized, if there's a way we can support you, we want to be able to do that. friends for your patience today and our slowing down to make sure we could get in line with our virtual audience. Virtual audience, thank you for your patience and letting us know that we needed to fix the sound. We hope that we'll see you this week um, during our times of prayer and during our Holy Week observances. And if not, we hope to see you next Sunday. Send an invitation to someone, perhaps a family member, a neighbor, a friend, even if you know that they aren't a Christian. Many people will come and their hearts will be open to come to church on Easter Sunday. And so have the courage to invite them and to let them know that they can come and sit with you. They won't be by themselves. 
and we're not going to beat nobody up. We're not going to say, man, you ain't been here all year. We don't do that kind of stuff here. All we do is welcome you, say God loves you, we love you, and we're glad of all the places you could chose, choose to go one Sunday that you came to be with us. We think that means we're special. And so please know that they can come next week. Our spoken benediction is as we go, we'll lift our voices together in this affirmation. Let's pray together. We are thankful for God's word. We declare that we are doers of the word and not hearers only. Our desire is for God's wisdom to be set deeply in our hearts so that we can both receive and give divine counsel, compassion, and correction. We delight to see the principles and promises of God manifested in our lives. May God transform us each day to live, look, and love more like Christ. Lord, please revive us, we pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you, your circumstances and situations, and all your relationships. Give you wisdom, mercy, grace, and peace. This week, trust God's purpose for your life. Trust God's plan for how that purpose will come about. And trust God's power to do it and to give you all that you need to walk out God's perfect plan. I love you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. You may pick up palms as you leave today. We'll see you next week.